yeah, so Jose on the left, uh, or Josie on the left, is actually a set of uh, standards, uh, RFCs, and uh, Jose is my particular implementation of them. We'll be using this terminology to disambiguate uh, throughout the talk, so whenever I say Josie, I'm referring to the standards, and whenever I say Jose, I'm referring to my implementation of those standards. So, Josie stands for JSON Object Signing and Encryption. And uh, it is a set of standards uh, for uh, formatting all sorts of cryptographic related stuff uh, in JSON format. Now, some of you are probably wondering why we need some new standards, and uh, there's actually qu quite a few reasons for this. Uh, for those of you who've been doing cryptography at all, uh, you know that our standards have grown up organically over time. So we started off uh, you know, with, with various different, here's how a key works, and then we started doing encryption and various other things. Uh, but it got really, really hairy quickly because, for example, what sort of format do you store your certificates in? What sort of formats do you store your keys in? All of this stuff uh, is, uh, everyone did sort of their own thing. And so, uh, as an example, uh, GPG, you know, is not the same as OpenSSL, for example. Uh, so uh, we also had need for uh, some for doing cryptography in the web space, and in particular for uh, bundling cryptographic data inside URLs, which is the one of the driving forces of this standards. And so uh, what we actually have here is the first cryptographic system that integrates all of the different parts of what we would today call a crypto system into one usable system uh, where everything sort of works with everything else. And, uh, and we're going to walk through how, how exactly this looks. We're going to start off with a really, really simple example. Uh, this example is just a symmetric uh, key. We call these JSON web keys or JWK for short. A JSON web key, uh, when it's a symmetric key, looks just like this. Uh, we have at the top uh, the KTY parameter, which just simply specifies what type of key this is. Uh, in this case, it's octets. So uh, we should expect that it's going to have a K parameter, and the, and the K uh, parameter is going to contain the actual octets of the key. These are base64 URL encoded. And then we also, in this example, have uh, an optional value that does not that is not actually required, uh, but can be present for uh, a variety of different keys. And in this case, this value is the algorithm parameter, and this indicates what uh, algorithm that this key can be used in or used with. Uh, and uh, so this is pretty much the simplest example we're going to see uh, on the set of slides. Notice that. Uh, this same pattern of representing binary as base64 data is going to be universal throughout uh, the, the, uh, all of the Josie specifications. Any questions about this? I'm hoping this one is, is pretty straightforward. Okay, let's, let's move on to a little more complex example. So this is also a JWK, same data format, uh, but this time we're representing not a symmetric key, but we're representing an elliptic curve key. In this case, we also have the uh, key type, KTY, at the top, exactly like the last one. This specifies EC. This is an elliptic curve key. Uh, we next then have the four required parameters for an elliptic curve key. The first is the name of the curve that we're actually representing. Uh, in this case, this is a P256 key. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with elliptic curves, uh, P256 is one of the standardized curves that's used by NIST. Uh, it's one of the most widely available, and uh, it's one of the ones that's standardized in, in JOSI. Uh, next, we have three parameters, X, Y, and D. Uh, because uh, keys are points, public keys in elliptic curve cryptography are points on an elliptic curve, we have an X and a Y value, which indicates where it is on the curve. And the D value is the private value, or the secret value. So, uh, so these, these are, this is a full public and private key, all in, all in one JSON object. Finally, we have two more optional parameters. And uh, notice that these are different optional parameters than the ones we saw on the previous slide. Uh, in this case, we have a key use, and this is allowed to be used for encryption. Uh, and finally, we have a uh, KID parameter, and this is just a unique identifier for key. It can actually be anything you want, uh, but it's pretty common to see the KID actually be a thumbprint of the key. Uh, but it can actually be any, any string that you want, and I'll explain more about what thumbprints are shortly. Any questions before we move on? So from here it gets much more complicated uh, because we are now moving into RSA keys. 
RSA keys, you notice they still have the same K, uh, KTY parameter at the top. This indicates what type of a key this is. And we have uh, the next, what is it, seven parameters are the RSA parameters. Actually, eight are the RSA parameters. So from here all the way down to here. And uh, the specific details of those I won't go into. So if you want to know more about RSA keys, there's lots of information on the, uh, on the interwebs and you can find it there. Uh, lastly, we do have two more optional parameters here. In this case, uh, we have the algorithm, which is like what we saw with the symmetric key. Uh, this is allowed to be used with the RS-256 algorithm, which is uh, a for uh, signatures, and it indicates that the data should be hashed with SHA-256, and then uh, the hash of the data should be signed with, with the RSA key. And then finally, we have another KID parameter. You notice this time it's a date. When the previous example, we just had the number one, which in this place is, case is like a serial number for keys that have been generated over time. Uh, in this case, it's the date in which the key was generated. Uh, again, this can be anything that you want. It's as long as it uniquely identifies uh, the key according to what, whatever system you're using. So those are the three main uh, key types that are used in the Josie crypto system. Uh, there's actually another one that has just recently been standardized, which for those of you who, who are uh, doing cryptography on a day-to-day -day basis, this is the CF CFRG curves. So things like uh, ED25519 and ED448 uh, have both recently been standardized as key types as well. Uh, one last thing that we should note is that uh, Josie actually standardizes a way to represent sets of keys as well, which is something we don't see in pretty much any other crypto system. Uh, so you can actually define a bundle uh, where you have this object and you have a parameter called keys, and it's just simply an array uh, of keys, but there's also extra parameters that you can put in here. Moving on to uh, performing a, a signature, this is actually the most complex example of a signature that we'll see today. So at the very top, we have our payload. This is the data that was actually signed. So whatever the message is that you want to sign is put into the payload. And again, base64, uh, URL safe, base64 encoded. And then we have an array of signatures. We have two signatures in this JWS. So here and here. Each signature uh, has a protected header. Now the protected header, as you can see all the way on the, the right side, over here, we actually have this object, uh, and that indicates the contents of what's inside the protected header. That structure is then base64 encoded and included uh, in the protected header. Uh, we have uh, another value called header, which is not protected. And what, this, what we mean by protected and, and not protected, by the way, is that uh, the protected header, if it's modified, the signature will fail to validate. But the, uh, the header that is not the protected header uh, can be modified, and it doesn't invalidate the signature. Uh, finally, we then have the signature uh, that is uh, a signature over the payload and the protected header. So this is the most complex example. Uh, if you, uh, This is also called, by the way, j a general serialization. And it's called general serialization because basically anytime you have more than one signature in a JWS, you have to have this array like this. But if you have a case where you are only ever going to have one signature, you can actually use another serialization called flat. And the way that the uh, flattened serialization works is it just basically takes all of the data from that uh, one serial or from that one signature and moves it up in the object hierarchy. So if you go back, we have protected header and signature here, and then we have protected header and signature here. So it just moves them up in the hierarchy and takes up a little less room. Uh, and uh, so you notice here, by the way, uh, we're saying in the header, we have a key. This is the key that was used to sign it. So some, if you were to receive, say, this JWS, you could go look in some key repository for uh, this particular key ID, and that's the one that should be able to, to validate the signature. However, there's also one more serialization. And what we're going to do, if you remember, we've got, uh, we've got uh, four items here. Now, we're going to leave off the header parameter, which you remember is not protected, so it could be modified. And we're going to take just the signature the protected header and the payload, and we can flatten this once again into a string. 
where you just simply put the protected header contents, followed by a period, followed by the payload, followed by a period, followed by the signature. Now, the unique thing that uh, we can actually do with this is we can put this in a URL. So uh, one, one particular case where this came up uh, was we were having a meeting uh, where we wanted to have a registration system. So people could sign up with their email address and it would send them an email to confirm their email. And, uh, and then uh, they would click the link. Of course, you've done this a million times on the internet, not, not if you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so uh, basically, w w I came into the meeting about three minutes late, and they had already designed the whole thing, and it was magnificent. There were like multiple moving parts, and there was databases and all sorts of stuff just for this registration system. And I came in, and I sort of raised my hand, and I said, why don't we just sign their email address and send it to them in a URL using this, using this data format, and you don't actually have to have any state on the server, because once they click the link, the server just validates the signature. You don't need to have databases. You don't need to have all of this massive code. It's just really simple and effective, right? So this is, this is one, of the, one example of, of how the Josie standards can be used very effectively. Um, and since Josie always uses URL safe base 64, which is just like regular base 64, but two characters are different in the encoding. So it is standardized, but it's, but it's slightly different than regular base 64. Uh, since Josie always uses URL, URL safe base 64, and then always uses periods to concatenate the fields, this is always safe to be inside a URL. We can do the same thing uh, with encryption. So in the last case, we were talking about signing. And now we're going to talk about encryption. This, this is the most complex example you'll see today. Um, because uh, encryption is slightly more uh, complicated than, than signing. So the way that encryption works is you are going to have an encryption key. And that encryption key is going to encrypt all the data. And then you're going to encrypt the encryption key using another key. Uh, and that key, in this case, we call the recipient key. So if I'm going to encrypt something to you, and to you, and to you, I only need to encrypt the content one time, and then I encrypt that one key to each of your own separate keys, right? And each of your recipients. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. So uh, in general format, we have, uh, the first thing we have is the, the uh, protected header at the top here, which is just like the signature. Uh, so it uses all the same mechanisms that we saw in a signature, but it's, but it's now being done for encryption. We have an unprotected header. Uh, protected header, by the way, if you remember, means that if you modify it, then the decryption will fail. Uh, but the unprotected header can be modified after the fact, and decryption will not fail. Uh, same encoding over here. So the protected header is actually in this format, and then it's, uh, it's uh, serialized into a string, and then base64 encoded and put into this protected header. After this, we have uh, the IV, the initialization factor for the cryptography. We have the ciphertext itself, which is the uh, plain text that we've now encrypted, is stored here as ciphertext. And then we have a tag. And the tag is the thing that validates that when we decrypt it, it hasn't been modified. So that gives us our authentication. So uh, all of this is basically we take the data in, we generate an IV, and that's stored here. We encrypt the data using, using a randomly generated key. That comes out as ciphertext. We do our authentication, which produces a tag. We stick the tag on there. We write our parameters into the protected header. And then finally, we take that key that we used to do the encryption, and we encrypt it to the actual recipients. And here's the recipients. We have two of them here, one and two. And uh, a recipient can have a per-recipient header, which is not protected. <coughs> and then when we encrypt it to the recipient, uh, we're encrypting the key that we use to, to encrypt this, and that encrypted key is stored here. And then we also have some optional parameters here, like which algorithm was used for the encryption. We have uh, things like which key ID should be used to decrypt this value, and so on. So this is the most complex example. I've probably hurt your brain a little bit, uh, but we're going to move on, and we're going to get more simple from here. So hopefully it should be simple to understand. Um, if you remember, we ha also had for the uh, JSON web signatures, we had a flat syntax, which is where when you have a single, uh, a single signature, you can just move all the contents upward into the object hierarchy. And we have exactly the same thing here. So if we go back, you notice we have two recipients here. And the important bits are that we have an encrypted key. Well, in this case, uh, we also have an encrypted key and a header. 
So if you have a single recipient, you can create the same object, but instead just put the encrypted key in the header uh, in the parent object, and there's an implicit recipient there. Just like JSON Web Signatures, we also have a compact format. So we're going to come back here. We have a protected, unprotected, IV, ciphertext, and tag. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Protect, these are the five we're going to take. Protected, IV, ciphertext, tag, and encrypted key. What does that do? Initialization vector. Yeah, it's basically a bit of random data to ensure that encryption is unique uh, for each encryption operation. It's, it's a public value. Uh, but it's used, it's the very first value you put into uh, to get a starting position in your cryptography. So, <clears throat> and it's used pretty universally, although it's used slightly differently depending on the algorithm you, you choose. It also would be different for a SHA-256. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you're using AES-GCM, right. uh, it, it will be slightly different than if you're using um, AES CBC HMAC. Okay. You're going to wash out through the initial bit. The IB is always zero. Right. Yeah. Could you describe what you tag was? Yes. Uh, so tag is uh, the it's the authentication information for for the ciphertext. So after you encrypt the data, then you uh, perform authentication on the ciphertext to make sure that it's not modified. So the tag indicates, uh, for one, let me give you a concrete example of this. Uh, in the algorithm AES CBC HMAC, uh, the actual encryption is done using AES CBC, and then an HMAC is done over the entirety of the ciphertext, and <clears throat> uh, the output from the HMAC is stored as the tag. Now when you go to do the decryption, the first thing you do is you validate that the ciphertext, you, you run that ciphertext through the HMAC again, and the HMAC will output a value. If that value doesn't match this, then the ciphertext has been modified and you absolutely should not do anything with it. You should drop it to the floor. Does that help? Yes, another question. Can you make sure you repeat the question? Oh, sorry, yes, I should do that. That, that question was, uh, can I explain what the tag parameter is? It is. Uh, the tag param The question is, was the tag parameter used for something uh, for algorithms other than HMAC? The answer is yes. Uh, for example, if you're using uh, AES-GCM, the tag is yielded as part of the encryption operation. So in that case, it's all done as one step. The plain text is input to AES-GCM, and the ciphertext comes out. And then when you are completely finished, the last block of ciphertext comes out, and the tag comes out. But it's all been done as a single operation. Yes? So, um, kind of, sort of, on the same tangent as this. So, with the, uh, I, I understand with the ID and the second texture, those are uh, inputs to this. So is the tag always going to be like an output for an output? Uh, the tag is an output during the encryption phase, and it's an input during, uh, it's an input during the encryption phase, and it's in. No, I'm saying this wrong. Start again. Okay, the tag is an output during the encryption phase, and it is an input during the decryption phase. Right, okay, that's... that's yeah. That yep, and the, the important thing of the tag is that it's validating that, that the actual message has not changed, okay. right? Because there's all sorts of attacks. If somebody can get a hold of your ciphertext and, and make changes to it and ask you to decrypt it, uh, the, there's all sorts of attacks you can do. So uh, the very first thing you want to do is validate the message has not been modified. Once you know that it's not been modified, then you proceed with decryption. So the tag basically the digest form. Uh, in the case of AES, uh, AES CBC HMAC, yes, it is a digest. In the case of other algorithms, it is not. Uh, it's sort of a generic. Remember, this is really. Uh, in this particular case, the JWE standards, we're not actually defining how the algorithms work. We're defining the storage format. Okay. And tag can be used in different ways by different algorithms, but it does roughly the same thing for all of them. Okay. So another question. Yes? Basic cryptography question. Sure. For integrity, for message integrity, the HMAC is also encrypted with the key, so that way a user 
the interceptor message that modifies the cipher text couldn't also modify the tag? Uh, it is not. Um, the, yes, the question was, is the tag also encrypted? And the answer is no. Uh, in the case of the algorithm AES-CBC-HMAC, which is one of the algorithms defined by the Josie stand standards, um, you actually generate a double length key. So instead of uh, 16 bytes, you would generate 32. The first half of that key is used for doing the encryption. The second half of that key is used for doing HMAC. I may actually have my halves backwards, but it's it's one of those two. So basically, you generate a, a double size key, and uh, one is used for HMAC, and one is used for uh, for the actual encryption. For AES-GCM, that's not the case. You use the same key for the entire operation. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so we already talked about having compact format, uh, which can, again, be used in URLs. So uh, if, for example, you wanted to have some date, maybe that you, st you uh, some data, excuse me, some metadata that you store, say, like in a cookie, and you want to store that on a, uh, on a client system, uh, you could use this, actually, if you wanted to put it in some kind of a URL, uh, like sending it in, in an email or something like that. And you could actually uh, bundle in encrypted data uh, along with a URL. Um, the next uh, data format we're going to talk about is the JSON Web Token. And a JSON Web Token is, the closest analogy is that it's the metadata that you get usually in a certificate, uh, particularly uh, in the, um, for, you know, for the, if you're using a user certificate, uh, this would be the similar kind of data that you would get in that certificate. So there's no actual cryptography involved in this. Uh, these are just the standard parameters that are well defined. Uh, and then uh, there's also in the standard a way to put your own data in here. It basically says that either you should define a standard and publish that standard, and then you can actually uh, have a uh, short name reserved for you. Or if you're doing something that's application specific, then you should use a um, a conflict resistant format, so something like uh, you know com dot example dot parameter foo, uh, and, and that would that would be sure not to collide with other people using using the same thing. Uh, we'll just walk very briefly through what these are. So the issuer is the person who is making the assertion. So they're saying uh, I'm vouching for the subject, which is me and P. McCullum, and the recipient for this is DefConf. That's you guys. And uh, this assertion will expire at this particular time, and it's not valid before this particular time, and it was issued at this particular time. And uh, finally, JTI is something that I forget off the top of my head. Yes, thank you. It's the token identifier. Uh, yeah, so this is a just as like the key, the KID parameter for keys, uh, but this is a unique identifier for this for this web token. Now, what's interesting is not the web token itself, which again has this defined information. There's also some additional stuff that's been defined since this point, uh, which could be put in here, and then you can add your custom data. But that's not the thing that's unique, or that's not the value itself. Well, the, the value of this is that you take this metadata and then you wrap it inside either a JWE, JSON Web Encryption, or a JWS, a JSON Web Signature. So uh, this is the way that you can cryptographically validate that this data uh, is actually not modified and that it's uh, who it's supposed to be and that only the person who's supposed to see the data can see it. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I don't like about the standard, uh, but is, uh, is well defined, uh, is that the uh, JWT can be wrapped in JWEs or JW, uh, JWSs and possibly recursively. So this means that you can actually pass the data across multiple hops and you know every hop could say add its own signature or it could add encryption uh, at various different layers and then when you receive it you basically need to unwrap all of the layers and, uh, and then you actually get the data at the end once you've validated every single layer. So it's a little bit complicated, and I haven't written code for this because it's hard. But that means you can write things like time stamp and signatures. Yes, correct. Yep. So it does have some positive uses. I, I only don't like it because it's actually just hard to implement, and I haven't implemented it yet. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so we've we, up until this point we've been talking about Josie, which is the set of specifications. So everything before this, you know, this slide and before, it should be standard. Everybody should be doing it exactly the same way. And everything that you see after this point is now talking about the specific implementation that I've done. So uh, we have uh, at Red Hat created the Jose project. The Jose project as a C library and a CLI implementation of the Josie specifications. So uh, we have support for all of the RFC defined algorithms. This statement is actually out of date because the CFRG curves were just recently standardized. Uh, but up until that point, we have all, all of the algorithms. And um, one of the neat things about this library is that we actually don't have any C data types natively. So what you and, and we have no date JSON parsing. Why this is important, uh, first of all, let's talk about the parsing. Parsing is really dangerous. I don't know if you watch CVEs. There's a lot of them for parsing bugs, right? And what you really don't want to have is your parsing and your encryption in the same place, right? That would be just absolutely a fundamental fail. And in fact, a lot of, uh, of implementers of Josie actually absolutely make this mistake. They take strings as input, strings as output, and they serialize everything. So, so I want to point out specifically, we do not do any JSON parsing. There is a a, uh, a really good library called Janssen, and uh, Janssen is really battle tested, and it works really well. And uh, th that is who does all of all of the parsing, and it can be done in another in another thread if you wanted to. Uh, and uh, it, it does not have to be related to uh, to Jose at all. But you pass us those parsed data types. Uh, but it's also further important to note that we don't then take those data types from, from Janssen and convert them into something C native. And the reason for this is that actually a lot of implementations do this. They make the mistake of saying, well, you give me something that's JSON and then I'll parse it into a language structure. And then we can operate in the language structure and then when we're done, we'll serialize it back out as JSON. Well, the problem with this is that the standards are intentionally designed to be uh, extremely fluid in the amount of optional data that you can have. And so what all the people do wrong when they implement this is they parse that into the C, C type and anything they don't know about, they drop on the floor. Well, now you've just completely lost all of this extensibility uh, and we don't want to do that. So uh, what we do is we don't have any native C data types. You just parse the raw JSON. And once you have a raw representation of that JSON, you hand it to our library and we do everything from there. Our API is also driven by a template approach. So what this means is that uh, instead of having, again, native data types which specify all of your options, you just hand us something that looks like the output you want. So for example, if you're generating a key, tell us what algorithm you want that key to be for, and then hand us that. And the way that you tell us what algorithm it's going to be for, if we go all the way back to the JWK, we have an algorithm parameter, right? So give us a JSON object that has only, leave out all of this data, has only the algorithm parameter, and we'll fill in all this data for you automatically, right? So it does require that you know a little bit about the specification in order to craft this template, uh, but it also means that we don't have to do all sorts of uh, overhead when uh, manipulating these data types. So it can actually be, you basically just parse the data, give us the data directly, and then you're done. Uh, whenever we have missing parameters in these templates, uh, we do our best to fill in the data. First of all, we infer, for example, algorithms from keys. If you don't tell us what kind of algorithm that you want to use for your encryption, and you've handed us a key that has the algorithm parameter, guess what? We can figure out exactly which algorithm you're trying to use. Uh, and we can do this without any ambiguity. Uh, one of the things that's important is that if we do detect the ambiguity or a conflict, we bail. Uh, but if we don't, if it's very obvious what you're trying to do, then we just do it for you. So uh, any, uh, all the parameters are inferred from keys, they're inferred from the headers, and we always, if they're not specified, use se uh, sensible, secure defaults. So if you didn't, I'm sorry, let me know. Yeah. If you didn't specify uh, KTY, or you didn't specify an ALG, then it will figure it out from the key. Um, it will figure out things it can figure out. Right. So uh, if you don't have an algorithm, we can't fill that in for you. Right. Um, but if you give us the algorithm, we can fill in all of the other information that the algorithm implies. Oh, right. Um, so the library design works like this. Uh, we have a very core library that uh, implements the Josie logic. And then all of the crypto itself is implemented as hooks, which means you can plug in another crypto system here at some point if you want. 
And then all of our uh, uh, all of our code is currently using OpenSSL, so we're not we're not building the uh, the algorithms are directly. And then on top of the C API, we provide a CLI tool which provides a thin layer around the C API. And what this means is that anything that you can do essentially in C, you can also do from the command line. Uh, the last thing is that we extensively unit test this against all of the test vectors from the, uh, from the RFC. Uh, we also use test vectors that have been produced by other parties as well, uh, and we're fully conformant to all of those. So uh, here's the URL to the project, github slash, uh, github.com forward slash latch set forward slash Jose. And it's really easy to install on Fedora, just DNF install Jose. So let's look at how to actually use the Jose uh, code. Three minutes? Oh, goodness. I'll go quickly. So if we have a function called uh, Jose JWK Gen. It takes a configuration object, which can be null, and any J uh, JWK template you want. You just tell it, basically, I want a key for this algorithm. And then it spits out that key, generates it for you. Uh, you can also specify things like, I don't want an algorithm specifically. I just want 16 bytes. Uh, and it can do that. And then lastly, uh, if you specify multiple templates, we will output a key set. If you remember, there's a, a key set uh, data type. And so if you just get, tell us, generate multiple keys, we'll output it as a set. Uh, by the way, anything that you put in this object, in this template, uh, that, that we don't know about, we leave it in place. We don't touch it. JW, uh, so we have some JWK utilities. The, uh, we have uh, pub, which removes all private key material. Uh, we have uh, a use parameter, which basically says, hey, can I use this key to do signatures? Can I use it to do encryptions? And it will tell us yes or no. And then finally, we can generate a thumbprint uh, from, the, from the public key material. Uh, we have uh, algorithms for signing. Uh, and we basically just, an algorithm, the C code is here, by the way, and the CLI code is here. Anything you can do with the CLI, you can do with C, and vice versa. I think there's only one exception to that. Um, basically, most of these parameters are null. So uh, typically, if you're doing a signature, the config parameter will be null, the signature will be null, and you'll say, here's my, where my JWS output is, and this is the key I want to use for the signature. So, but if you want more uh, control, you can fill in the other fill in the other data. Verification is basically done the same, uh, just in the opposite direction, of course. And uh, here we do. Oh, uh, one thing I need to say here is that if you specify multiple keys, we give you general. Uh, if you do one key, we give you flattened serialization. If you specify the dash C option, we give you compact serialization. And uh, the last thing is that you can actually create a signature that does not contain the uh, the payload in it, it can be contained in another file if you want to. So verification is basically the same thing, uh, just the other side of the of the signature. And we have a non-zero exit status here and a zero exit status here. Uh, here's a case where we have a detached payload, so it's not actually in the object itself. Same thing with encryption. Uh, you can do uh, multiple keys, you get generalized serialization, one key flattened serialization, this dash C option gives you compact serialization. And one of the downsides, by the way, to encrypting or, or to encrypting or signing data with, with uh, the JOSI standards is that, uh, for example, all your ciphertext, uh, if it's big ciphertext, it's now going to be base64 encoded, which makes it even bigger, which is why you would want to use this detached serialization. Detached serialization is going to output the ciphertext as binary, to it, and all the other parameters are just going to be inside your JSON. All right. That's, yeah. <laughs> There's other stuff here to, that's cool. Um, let me just say this. Uh, we're, gonna, we're working on adding PKCS11 support. We would love to have additional crypto library support. We don't have any JSON web token functions yet, but if you want to add those, please contribute. We also would like to add functions to convert from certificates. Uh, and we'd like to, end it to add any other uh, RFC features. Of course, pull requests are welcome. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to field those. Do we have time for questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll hang outside the door. If you have questions, just come grab me. On the other side, our next talk may be an Easter egg talk, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a cylindrical uh, I like